All righty. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Robbie Baldwin. I'm a contractor of the General Services Administration. I'm going to be our electronic moderator today uh, for the Linden and Sumas Land Ports of Entry Environmental Impact Statement Public Scoping Meeting. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Emily Grimes. All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'll start off with a welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your days to join us this afternoon. Um, as Robbie said, this um, this is our first public meeting, our public scoping meeting regarding the environmental review process for both Linden, and I'll refer to, excuse me, as the, as the Kenneth G. Ward Land Port of Entry and the Sumas Land Port of Entry. And we'll go ahead and get started on the, the next slide and I'll go over the agenda with everyone. So I'll go ahead and get started on introductions by introducing myself. My name is Emily Grimes and I work for Region 10 GSA. And Region 10, uh, what that covers the state of Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and Idaho. And for these projects, we have five in Region 10, which I'll go over later on in the presentation. But for today, obviously, everyone's here for Linden and Sumas. Um, but I serve as the NEPA project manager, and NEPA being the National Environmental Policy Act. And I'll let the other presenters introduce themselves. I'm not one of the presenters, but I did want to introduce myself. My name is Natalie Jacques. Um, I'm with Solve. Um, as Robert pointed out, we're the contractor supporting GSA with the development of this environmental impact statement. Leon? Yeah, Leon Kankiewicz. I'm a... Uh, hmm, they get, there are people hearing an echo there? Slightly. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't that time. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a contractor as well with, with Solve, longtime uh, uh, environmental planner working with the National Environmental Policy Act or, or NEPA and helping manage this project. Robbie? As I mentioned before, my name is Robbie Baldwin. I'm a project manager on this project. I'm a con contractor assisting GSA with the preparation of the EIS, and I am a biologist by training. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pat Manning from the GSA. Thanks, Robbie. Um, Pat Manning, I am a capital project manager for GSA in Region 10. So I work with Emily, the same four states, and I am the project manager uh, for GSA uh, for both Linden and Sumas. Kim. My name is Kim Gia. I'm the Regional Historic Preservation Officer for Region 10 GSA, so I'm responsible for cultural resources. Melissa? Sorry, I couldn't get off mute. I'm Melissa Hybray. I am a project manager and I'm assisting Pat on Linden and Sumas. All right, thank you everyone. That concludes the introductions for the presenters, um, at least today, except Melissa won't be presenting today. She'll be supporting. So I do wanna go over just the purpose of this public meeting. And as you see, we have right at there, one of the one of the first bullets is it is informational. GSA wants to share any preliminary information that we have available that we can share to the public in order to give everyone a better idea of what's being proposed at both the Kenneth G. Ward and the Sumas Land Ports of Entry. And this is why it's so important to, to have these and to share this information because we do need those comments, no matter what they may be in relation to the these projects, these comments help form the environmental review document that we're working on, which is an environmental impact statement. And so that's why it's just highly encouraged. It's not required, but it is highly encouraged for all comments. Um, and again, later on in the meeting or in the, yes, in the presentation, I'll go over all the options that GSA has available in hopes that we make it easier on everyone to provide those comments and to share in addition to having time to share those comments during the comment period, which I'll also discuss later on in the meeting. And another huge factor is that, just so everyone knows, your comments are taken seriously. They get reviewed by both um, GSA, Solve, and also CVP. 
Um, and if we can, how depending on, I guess, the areas and the subject matter, they'll also be addressed in the draft EIS, unless you specifically ask for a direct response. And GSA has the information to actually provide to you at this time. Um, and then also another thing, I know when you guys signed on, um, it, you had a, a pop-up window letting you know that the meeting is being recorded. And it's just another reminder, this meeting is being recorded for purposes because we understand not everyone could, you know, take the time out of their busy days to attend this meeting. So we do plan on uploading this presentation along with the recording of this presentation to each project webpage. Even though we're combining the meeting, if you visit Linden um, webpage for GSA, which we'll share, um, this presentation meeting will also be uploaded there and same for SUMAS. Um, so that's a, a big one for us. I mean, we just wanted to let everyone know that. So don't feel, or if you have someone, if you know someone that wasn't able to make it, please let them know they have other opportunities to watch and comment. And then also for accessibility, we do have closed captioning available um, if needed. And then, like I mentioned already, we have GSA has des designated project pages for both Linden and SUMAS uh, for you to visit. And I, I do want to point out, I know you do not have the presentation in front of you today. So there are active links in here. Once the presentation does get uploaded to those pages, you will be able to click on those. But those also will be those actual URLs will be placed in the chat box towards the end of the meeting. So if you want to copy and paste those and visit those later, um, please do so. And then, like I said, too, um, we will have plenty of time. The goal is in of this meeting is so the public and other agencies can submit their comments. And um, we're right now, based off of the attendance, we are lim eliminate excuse me, we are putting a limit of two minutes on for each person to speak um, as well. And I'll go over towards the end when, when everyone finishes their presentations on how we'll um, go through the comments, like starting with the chat box, and then people can raise their hands and we'll go in order to allow people to actually speak. And we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. And so the agenda here, well, I'll briefly go over um, GSA's role in the project. Then Pat Manning will go over the project background. And then we have Solve, who is our environmental consultant. They'll discuss NEPA, the NEPA aspect of the project, which is one of the reasons for being here. And then um, GSA's Kim Gant will also go over um, National Historic Preservation Act and how that uh, is concurrently happening along with NEPA. And then we will conclude and open up the virtual floor for commenting. And so I'll go ahead um, and go to the next slide where I'll briefly go over um, just GSA. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, we have an acronym slide. Again, so you will not have this in front of you uh, throughout the meeting, but it will be uploaded later on. But we did put in here some common acronyms that are used throughout this presentation. That's hopefully helpful when you actually do have the presentation in front of you. Now this press, now on this slide, I'll briefly go over GSA's mission and um, just a little background of who we are. And so our, our mission at GSA is to deliver the best customer experience and value in real estate acquisition and technology services to the government and the American people. Um, we also provide a centralized procurement for the federal government, which includes offering services and facilities that other federal agencies need to serve the public. We also help agencies build, federal agencies build and, and acquire office space products and other workspace services, which includes overseeing the preservation of historic federal properties. And I do highly encourage you guys, if you're interested in GSA, we have uh, a GSA mission and background webpage, and there's plenty of resources and links on there where you can just research who we are and what we do. But then also here, it's just important to see how we tie into this project as well, um, because GSA does own those um, the property that the Land Port of Entries do um, sit on, and CBP uh, leases those, those areas from us. So that's kind of how we operate without GSA as a um, real estate, for real estate, excuse me. 
And on the next slide, I'll go over um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which you'll hear referred to as the BIL. And so it is important to, to note that it was signed by President Biden on November 15th of 2021 with the purpose of um, investing in our nation's infrastructure, competitiveness, and communities. It is um, overseen by the GSA LP LPOE program, which provides the funds to modernize and improve the LPOEs at both northern and southern borders. And GSA's role here is where GSA was um, pretty much a lot um, given 3.4 billion for all the regions, not just Region 10, but for all the regions to fund these LPOE construction projects. And then also in addition, CBP was um, provided funds for operations and support requirements for approved projects. And so just for Region 10, we have five projects that are occurring right now. And those five projects we have, um, I'll start with the state of Washington. We have um, a Blaine, Washington, and then we also have Linden and Sumas, which you're here for today. We have the Port Hill, Idaho, where we have a, a border crossing there. And then we also have Alcan, Alaska um, at the border there. And then again, um, if you want to, and I highly encourage you to, GSA has a bipartisan infrastructure law construction projects webpage. And on there, it has a map of all the states. And there you can click on and explore all the projects that are happening around the region, also Region 10, and any planned projects that are happening right now. It's kind of neat and it's helpful just to see what, what we're doing at these sites and what, what other um, regions are doing with their projects as well. So if you have time, and again, I'll provide the, the URL and the chat box at the end of the meeting so you can explore. And I'll go ahead and put you in Pat Manning's hands. Thanks, Emily. Uh, as I said before, my name is Pat Manning. I am the project manager for GSA, and I am managing both the Linden, Kennedy G. Ward, Linden Land Port of Entry expansion, as well as the Sumas Land Port of Entry expansion. So a uh, little bit about the project background. So for uh, Kennedy Ward, uh, the current port was constructed in 1988, which means the port right now is sitting at about 25 years. Typically, uh, CBP and GSA, their planning horizon for ports is in the 30-year, maybe 40-year range. 40 would be like looking at your crystal ball, looking way, way down the road, right? So um, we're getting towards that 30-year mark right now. Uh, the existing port sits on just over 4.2 acres. And it has one main building along with an inspection canopy, and together they encompass a little over 16,000 square feet. Uh, right now, the port has four non commercial lanes. So these are the lanes that process uh, personal vehicles, right? Uh, one of those lanes also operates as uh, what we call permit only commercial lanes. So, permit only, uh, if you think about trusted traveler, or TSA pre-check, you, if you're a commercial company, you enroll in this program, you get pre-cleared, and then CBP will let you on, when you're in this program pre-cleared, let you process commercial traffic through that one lane at uh, Linden. But as of now, Linden doesn't process a significant amount of commercial traffic. Uh, with that, the port currently operates 16 hours a day. So that's uh, 0800, so 8 a.m. through midnight, seven days a week. Um, CBP, along with GSA uh, for Linden, we completed a feasibility study in August of 2019, so roughly three years ago, four years ago. Um, and so for CBP and GSA, feasibility studies are the first phase or stage in planning a project. It's if you will, a 30,000 foot view of the project. In general terms, what are CBP's requirements? What do they need? And then CBP and GSA and contractors get together and look to see how we may be able to meet those needs. That study was done in 2019 and that led to the funding request that became part of the uh, BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and that's partially how we got here now, right? Um, that feasibility study, uh, it highlighted CBP's program of requirements. And two of the things that were uh, significant is limited vehicle, uh, both POV and commercial processing capabilities, and the pedestrian uh, processing capabilities at Linden. Um, 
kind of suffer from a safety perspective. It's not the easiest port to traverse, even though it's somewhat small. Um, it's not the easiest port to traverse for pedestrians. Next slide. So uh, what are the purpose and needs for this project? So for Linden, and you'll see the same top bullet point for the first one, uh, for SUMAS as well. So the main purpose and need of the project is CBP's operational needs for Linden. Uh, we're trying to optimize the operational and traffic flows. So the operational flow is how the CBP officers traverse through the port. How do the public, uh, if they're going through an inspection, traverse through the port? traffic flows, that's obviously your vehicle flows, whether that's a personal vehicle or a commercial vehicle, like a truck or a semi-trailer. Uh, we need to address uh, facility deficiencies. The building is approaching 30 years old, um, improve customer service to travelers, uh, and provide a comfortable and safe working environment for port personnel. Um, the current port as it stands right now on the 4.2 acres doesn't have any room to expand or modernize within that current footprint. The new port under CBP's requirements call for one dedicated traffic lane for commercial and four dedicated, or sorry, increasing the non-commercial, this is the private vehicle, from four to five lanes and adding four dedicated commercial lanes uh, to process that commercial traffic. At the end of the project, CBP's vision um, would be to run that port 24-7, uh, 365. They have some hurdles to get there, uh, staffing hurdles and, and the like, but that is their ultimate long-range vision uh, when they expand Linden. Um, and the expanded port will provide CBP with the ability and flexibility to install new technologies as they become available. Next slide. Okay, SUMAS. So SUMAS, like Linden, uh, was actually constructed the same year, came online in 1988. And SUMAS uh, consists of two main buildings. They occupy just under or just over 12,000 square feet. And it's situated on a four acre uh, parcel in North SUMAS, right along the Canada border. Uh, for those who may not be aware, not in the Northwest uh, Linden and Sumas are separated by a uh, about 10 miles as the crow flies right across the northern border. So um, fairly close. They serve somewhat the same populations on both sides of the border. Um, uh, for Sumas, uh, the original port uh, was actually constructed in the early 1930s. It, it's a, a historic structure. And when GSA... Uh, modernized SUMAS last in the early mid 80s. Uh, we re relocated that port building um, approximately a block and a half away. It's still situated in downtown SUMAS um, and it's owned by a private party. GSA no longer owns it. We sold it to a private party and now they own and operate that building. Um, the port right now has uh, five non commercial lanes which service both uh, bus traffic as well as personal vehicles. And they have two commercial lanes which service uh, commercial vehicles, so trucks, tractor trailers, and the like. SUMAS, unlike Linden, operates 24-7, 365 right now. So this is a full round-the-clock 365-day port. Um, like uh, Linden, we completed a feasibility study for SUMAS. Uh, the SUMAS feasibility study was completed uh, approximately a year before Linden. Uh, we finished the SUMAS feasibility study in November 2018. And uh, along with or similar to Linden, uh, CBP's program of requirements showed that there's limited uh, vehicle and pedestrian processing capabilities. Um, next slide. Just a, an interesting fact about SUMAS and, and one of the reasons why pedestrian uh, Processing is so important. So uh, Linden is actually the second busiest pedestrian crossing on the northern border. The most busy is uh, Niagara Falls, but SUMAS actually has the second largest pedestrian uh, crossing. And, and everybody that comes here doesn't believe it, but it's actually extremely busy from a pedestrian standpoint. So um, purpose need for the project for SUMAS. So just like uh, Linden, we need to meet CBP's operational needs for SUMAS. 
We need to operate, optimize their operational and traffic flows, address facility deficiencies, improve customer service to the travelers, and provide a safe and comfortable working environment for port personnel. Uh, like Sum or like Linden, uh, SUMAS is constrained by their current footprint, and they are no longer able to serve the traffic volume that's already existing at SUMAS. Uh, CBP uh, for SUMAS, their plan is to increase the non-commercial lanes from two to three, and then at, or non-commercial lanes. Sorry, that's the POVs. That's your private vehicles and increase the uh, commercial lanes from two, adding two more to a total of four. And uh, the increase uh, will permit CBP to uh, install new technologies they become available to help uh, serve their mission. Um, next slide. All right, so just milestones. So this is um, what we like to say as a, as a marathon. It's not a quick process, and that's deliberate uh, for a lot of reasons. One is the NEPA process. Uh, we take our time doing this process. This NEPA process is, is approximately 24 months long, and that's to make sure that we properly engage with the public, obtain all your comments, do all of our due diligence environmental-wise, and that whole process takes two years. So. Um, Basic overview, um, right now, we are studying both Linden and SUMAS under the same NEPA um, contract. At the end of this, we will actually get two separate reports, um, one EIS, Environmental Impact Statement for Linden, and a separate Environmental Impact Statement for SUMAS, even though they're being performed by the same contractor at the same time for GSA and CBP. We're also going to uh, go into very shortly here in October, uh, awarding what we call a project development study. So this is taking that 30,000 foot feasibility study and bringing it down to 5,000, 10,000 feet, looking specifically at the port, looking at the property, seeing how best we can serve CBP and meet all the requirements, and also uh, bringing in the environmental impact that may come out of the NEPA process and at the end of that project development study, we'll have a detailed schedule, a detailed plan for what we're gonna construct at both of these sites, and a detailed budget to see exactly what it's gonna cost so that we know we have enough funding uh, to meet those requirements, right? Um, that PDS study is, is just like the NEPA process is uh, going to be awarded to one contractor that one contractor will study both ports together. And uh, at the end, just like the NEPA, we'll actually get two separate deliverables, a set of construction documents for Linden and a set of construction documents for SUMAS. So longer term, right now it's August, 2023, right? So we are planning to do this project using what we call the design build uh, acquisition. So this is where GSA hires one contractor who's responsible for both the design of the port as well as its construction. So one construction contract or one contract award that covers both design and construction. We expect to make that award in the summer of 2025, September. So approximately two years from now. First step after we do the award is the design process. So for Linden, we're looking at November of 25 to February of 27. So that's three and a half years from now, right? SUMAS, same start, November of 25. The design of SUMAS, we expect to take a little bit longer. It's a little bit larger of a port, a little more involved. We expect that to be done in March of 27. So year and a half or two and a half years from now, three and a half years from now. Um, construction duration. So for Linden, we're expecting uh, the construction to start in approximately August of 2026. So three years from now. So everybody in the, the local area won't really see any construction impacts for three years. We expect the project right now to take approximately two years. So that would put the completion of Linden in June of 28. 
Sue Mass, we expect to start a little bit earlier, a month earlier, so July of 26. And because it's a little bit larger reported, the time is going to take a little bit longer. We expect that construction to end in August of 28. So it's a five-year process at this point to get to completion for either one of these ports. Right now, we're looking at construction phasing as one of the options that we're actually evaluating under NEPA and we'll also be evaluating under the PDS. And basically what that comes down to is what is the least impactful uh, way we can construct these ports so that the community impacts are uh, minimized to the greatest extent. That may mean that we construct both ports simultaneously. It may mean we construct one port entirely bring that port back online, and then move to the second port, construct that entirely, and then bring that back online. We're still evaluating that. We're asking for input as part of the NEPA process. We'll develop it under NEPA. We'll also evaluate it uh, under the project development study that we're about to start in October. Um, but yeah, we're, we're essentially evaluating what is one of the alternatives we're evaluating is how we can best sequence this work to minimize the impact to everybody in the local community. Next slide. Thank you, Pat. Yep. I'm going to say a few words here about the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And this is an act dating back some 50 years or half a century that requires all federal agencies to look at the impact of their proposed projects or proposed actions, as we call them, on the human environment. I sometimes refer to it as the Look Before You Leap Act. And by the human environment, we mean both the natural environment, such things as wildlife, wetlands, and endangered species, as well as the social and economic environment. And this includes resources such as cultural and historic resources, which we're addressing in this EIS and which Kim will describe a little bit later. Uh, agency responsibilities under NEPA include looking at multiple alternatives before deciding which one is the one the lead agency, GSA, will be taking. And also disclosing impacts and considering public input throughout the, uh, the NEPA process. This uh, scoping that we're doing right now is the first uh, major opportunity for that public input, which is going to help us decide, help GSA decide which alternatives are going to be analyzed, as well as what the types of effects may be most important and of most interest to the public. Next slide. So as the lead federal agency under NEPA in, in this process, GSA has to comply with a number of uh, relevant laws. Three of the, the key ones are the Endangered Species Act and specifically Section 7 of that act, which requires federal agencies to consult with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about the potential for effects on endangered species, threatened species, and their potential habitats. Another one, another one of these key acts is uh, the Clean Water Act, specifically Section 404 for the discharge of uh, dredge material or fill, fill material into waters of the United States, including adjacent wetlands to those waters of the United States. And then a third of the major acts that uh, come up under NEPA are, is uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, and specifically section 106, which under federal act, uh, projects like, like this one, requires the lead agency, GSA in this case, to consult and over and analyze potential effects on cultural and historic properties. Next slide. So here's a schematic of the NEPA process. Uh, GSA issued a notice of intent or NOI, which was published in the federal register. We are now at the public scoping phase, uh, which again solicits input from the public on what should be studied in the EIS. GSA will next prepare the draft EIS, 
uh, that is then issued when, when it's complete, the so-called draft is actually issued as an environmental impact statement to the public. And then you will have a, a, an opportunity to comment on that. There will be a 45 day review and comment period coming up in, in, in some months or uh, in, in the coming year. And um, during that period, we'll be having another public meeting. There will also be an opportunity to send in written comments to uh, via a number of ways, which we'll describe later. Uh, after that is over, a final EIS, final environmental impact statement will be issued. And then a record of decision or ROD, which uh, describes the entire process and um, records or documents the decision that GSA will take with regard to the project. What alternative will it select? What are the trade-offs? What are the pros and cons, et cetera? Next slide, please. So the purpose of scoping, the, pro the, the step that we're in right now is to uh, gather and solicit input from the public and uh, including uh, other agencies, both federal, state, local, and tribes on the proposed uh, development of modernized LPOEs at both the Linden and Sumat, uh, Sumas ports of entry. And then these comments help GSA decide which alternatives uh, should be examined, as well as the resource areas that are likely to be most important in the EIS. That is, what is of concern to the public? Uh, next slide. So the major contents of an EIS, of an environmental impact statement, are four. One, the purpose and need. Two, the alternatives. Three, the affected environment and for the environmental consequences. The purpose and need gets at what the federal agency is attempting to achieve. The alternative, step number two, is the different ways that the federal agency might achieve these goals expressed in the purpose and need. And then the affected environment, the third part, major part of an EIS, looks at which resources uh, which areas of uh, effect there, there might be. And then the environmental consequences actually uh, predicts those particular effects, as well as considering what can be done to avoid, minimize, or, in, or mitigate, that is reduce the effects of uh, potentially significant effects or impacts. Next slide. As mentioned earlier by Pat, the purpose under NEPA for, for uh, the proposed action is to modernize and expand both ports of entry to improve their functionality, capacity, and their sustainability. And then the need is to meet CBP's operational needs for the LPOEs, optimize uh, operational and traffic flow, address facility deficiencies that have built up over the years or developed over time, improve the customer service to travelers, and provide a more comfortable and safe working environment for CBP staff and personnel. Next slide. So the EIS, as we envision it now, is going to examine three action, what we call action alternatives, and one no action alternative. Uh, the no action alternative here on the bottom would continue to operate under existing conditions. Basically, things will continue as, there are, as they are right now, and no construction or demolition would take place. This, under law, under the NEPA statute, has to be studied in every environmental impact statement and every environmental uh, assessment. It's a baseline against which the action alternatives on the top are compared. And the action alternatives in this case would all involve acquiring land, demolishing the existing facilities, and constructing new ones at both Linden and Sumas ports of entry. And these alternatives vary in the amount and location of acquired land, the height of the buildings and their layout, as well as in the phasing of construction. Next slide. So the affected environment then, the third 
major step in an environmental impact statement, looks at what the existing conditions are for the different resources. What is the existing water quality in the vicinity, the air quality, traffic conditions, wildlife, land use, noise levels, all of those are different aspects of the affected environment. And what we try and do is focus only on those uh, environmental parameters or aspects that are likely to be affected. We try and avoid what we call an encyclopedia. We're only looking at those facets of the environment that might potentially be affected by the proposed actions or the no action alternative. Next slide. And then the environmental consequences section, the, the fourth main part of an EIS, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is attempting to predict impacts from either continuing what is there now, i.e. the no action alternative or under the action alternatives. And we use various criteria to evaluate these potential effects, the magnitude of those effects, how much, how large, their duration or frequency, how long will they last? Only throughout the duration or only during the two-year construction process, or will they last over the long term or permanently? The extent is how, how widespread those effects are going to be. Is it only the construction site or does it extend beyond that into the community or into surrounding habitats and land uses? And then the likelihood is what are the probability of a what is the probability of a given impact of occurring? Next slide. So here are the upcoming steps in the NEPA process. Um, as uh, the scoping gets underway and is concluded, we will uh, begin the analysis of the draft EIS. And this will be an analysis of those, as I mentioned, those resource areas with the potential for being affected by the proposed action. When the draft EIS is released to the public, there will be a 45-day comment period during which there will be another public, public meeting to receive comments on the document. Overall, we'll encourage you to submit written comments on different aspects of the document as well as on, on the project. Uh, those comments will be incorporated. We'll, each of them will be considered and broken down into their different parts and incorporated into the document as an appendix, typically. Sometimes those comments actually necessitate changes to the draft EIS as we convert it into the final EIS. And then the last step here, the final EIS involves the release, the distribution or publication and release to the public of that final document. Uh, next slide. So uh, with regard to the conclusion of the NEPA process, uh, after we consider public input, the final EIS will be published. There will be a, a so-called notice of uh, a, a record of decision, excuse me, will be published, which as I mentioned before, documents the entire NEPA process and indicates what GSA's decision will be, which of the alternatives will be selected. And then this rod or record of decision will notify the public of the decision that's being made and it will discuss the, the decision will be based on considerations of cost, practicality, the agency mission and the potential environmental impacts of any given action. Next. Kim. Hi, thanks Leon. Again, my name is Kim Gant. I'm the Regional Historic Preservation Officer for GSA and I sit in Tacoma, Washington with Pat and Emily and Melissa. Um, my job is to make sure we uh, take care of cultural resources. So the National Historic Preservation Act is separate law from NEPA. It can happen with or without NEPA, uh, but it often happens alongside, especially for big projects like this. Uh, Section 106 establishes the consultation process to identify any historic resources that can be potentially affected by a project. So anytime the federal government does something, we have to figure out if it's going to uh, affect any historic properties. Uh, and if we do figure out that it will his affect historic properties, we have to seek ways to avoid or mitigate any adverse effects to those properties. Uh, 
And historic and cultural resources can can be many different things. Maybe you guys have heard of the National Register of Historic Places, um, uh, historic districts. They can be buildings or structures like a bridge. It can be an archaeological site, an object, a ceremonial site, or a cultural landscape such as a park. Things like that. Um, there there may be cultural resources located in the vicinity of the current LPOE. So. Lyndon and Stu Mass, we're in the process right now of trying to figure out if there are any cultural resources that may be affected by this project. So that's part of why we are here talking with you today is to um, ask the public if there are any known cultural resources that we need to be aware of. But we're not on the ground, so it, uh, it often uh, we often get information from public. So we are also conducting surveys. Uh, we have cultural resource consultants that are, will go out and uh, survey the potential affected areas and let us know if they find any historic properties in the area. Next slide, please. So these, these two uh, processes happen at the same time, but where we are in the um, National Historic Preservation Act process on the bottom is we are still at the first Gauge. We're still determining whether or not there are any historic or cultural resources within either of those project areas. Um, if we determine there are some, we will determine how they're affected and whether or not we have to um, mitigate any adverse effects to the historic properties. That usually ends up being a memorandum of agreement um, between the parties. Um, Often the State Historic Preservation Office um, is, is a required consulting party um, and anyone else who is interested at the time. And that pretty much uh, goes over the Section 106 process. So let us know if you know of any cultural resources. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kim and Pat and Leon. And I do, I know Natalie, who is from Solve and our um, PM on this project, she did want to give a brief update and clarification regarding the EIS. So I'll go ahead and let her um, do that. Hi, everyone. Um, it was, uh, I just wanted to point out, it was actually correct in the slide and referred to um, in, earlier in the presentation, but um, we will be developing one environmental impact statement, one, one document that will cover both uh, land ports of entry. Um, it, it was correct in the slide. I think it was mentioned earlier that there would be two documents. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so that is uh, that's coming your way. So uh, I'll let uh, Emily get back to the presentation. Got it. Thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. And so here it comes at the point, um, just going over all of the options that are available to submit your comments um, to GSA. So the first one, which will be posted in the chat box, we have a comment form that can be submitted during this meeting and which will also be uploaded to both Linden and SUMAS GSA web pages. We also have where, which we encourage you to speak during this meeting. If you feel comfortable, you don't have to, but if you feel comfortable, please do um, raise your hand or you can also put your comment in the chat box. Everything gets recorded. Um, so, and again, I, like I mentioned in the beginning, we are limiting the comments. Well, it's planned to limit comments for two minutes, the verbal comments. But if we have time, we definitely will not interrupt you. Or if we, if um, later on, we can circle back and, and so you can finish your comment if need be. And then third, we have um, where you can email your comments. GSA created two separate project inboxes for both Linden and SUMAS. Even though it is under one EIS, both of these projects are both of these projects are separate. It would be separate construction, even though um, one impacts the other when it comes to operations and how it may turn out. Again, everything is preliminary; nothing has been set in stone. So, as you see here, um, there's the information on these um, on the both email boxes that we have, and then you can also mail your comments in. Just please put attention, Emily Grimes, because I this is a very large building, and I want to make sure I get your comments if you decide to write those in, and then you'll see the address right there. Um, for you to utilize if need be. And then um, lastly, we do have for press inquiries only, we have our um, public affairs officer, um, Christy chidester Vodashek, and her number and email address is there for you to contact her as well. And another thing I do want to post, or at least 
you know, call to attention, not post, call to attention. We do have posters that will be posted in the chat box as well. And one of those posters does include pretty much this a similar slide, which gives you all the options that you have to submitting comments. So you have it in multiple areas. In addition to, if you go on to each project web page, you can find the links there under the environmental review section. I do want to point that out because there's a lot happening on each web page. But if you refer to the environmental review section, you'll find a lot of helpful resources and links there. And again, I do want to point out here, you, you do have our comment period in September 12th of 2023. So just make sure you get all these initial comments in. And again, you will have another opportunity when we um, publish that draft EIS, or not publish it, excuse me, when we make that available to the public, and it will be the same type of notifications. There'll be a notice of availability published in the Federal Register, and then we'll also send out um, notifications, emails to interested parties, um, there'll be social media posts and newspaper ads, and we will be holding another meeting that, again, will be around the same time frame in the evening in hopes of catching people after work that can make, um, that can make it, and it will be recorded. And so with that being said, I'll go ahead where, um, and I, another thank you again for you guys taking your time and staying on with us, but I'll go ahead. I, I don't, I can't see the chat, but I'll let Robbie or, or Natalie inform me, but we'll open it up. So if anyone wants to make any comments right now, please raise your hand and we can go down the line. Sure. <clears throat> um, and just for everyone's reference, unfortunately, Zoom is not cooperating with me right now and I cannot post these these posters in the chat. I do have the emails of everyone on the call. I will be emailing you the posters individually. Um, with that being said, if you are unfamiliar with the hand raising function on Zoom, there are three dots that say more on the bottom right hand of your screen. There is a, a option that says reactions. From that message, you can raise your hand and I will see it and then I will call on you. Uh, if you raise your hand while someone else is speaking, I'm going to write down your name in the order that they come, and then I will be monitoring the time. Um, you'll be giving two minutes to speak. And our first speaker is Brandy Zielstra. I hope I did not butcher that pronunciation. And once you start speaking, I will start the clock. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So are we allowed to ask questions for this, or is it simply comments? You are allowed to ask questions, Emily, correct? Okay, so we live and own a business in Sumas. Um, in the last three years, we've gone through COVID. We had a natural disaster and we've just gotten back to even partially um, getting the traffic back in Sumas that we re rely on from the Canadian um, people. So for you, or not you, but for the border to close completely, that will completely crush many businesses here in Sumas. Um, is there any consideration in possibly closing it at night to allow for people to come down during the day to still use our grocery store, our mailing services, our gas stations? Because if not, and you just simply close it down for a year or two, SUMAS will die. Did I lose you? Hi, no, Brandy, I'm here. I don't know if that's something Pat would be able to answer at this time, but definitely that is an important, you know, for you to bring that up. When it comes to closing, I know it was mentioned that that Linden would close at one point and then SUMAS, once Linden's finished, then SUMAS um, would close at another point. Um, the length of the closure, um, I would have to check with Pat on that, but we can definitely, that's something that would be addressed um, in the impact statement, in the environmental impact statement, because that can obviously be an, um, an impact to, to local businesses as well. So that could be a follow-up. Sure. Um, if, that, if you're okay with that. I, I, I want to clarify, the, biz, the towns are about 10 miles as the crow flies, the two borders in between, but the business from Abbotsford will not go through Linden to come back to Sumas um, to utilize our, our businesses. We just this year got a grocery store that is mainly supported by Canadian tourists going through town. 
Um, we have recently um, got a new gas station that's opening. So many businesses will die if the border is closed during the day. It, it just will happen, unfortunately. And that means for the people that live in Sumas, we lose those resources as well. We now have to go another 20 miles to a grocery store or 20 miles to a gas station. Um, and Sumas has been through so much, like I said, with COVID and then our natural disaster where 75% of our town lost their homes and they're just starting to rebuild. It's, it's just really going to be devastating if that border closes for any amount of time. No, understood. And, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. That is important to factor in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, you are up next. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Okay, you can hear me. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Lisa Marks, and I am an educator, and I also am a special representative for the Carpenters Union. And uh, I just wanted to mention, and listening to the concerns of having the city of Sumas close down, all the environmental impacts and everything that's of a concern, you know, with building a project of this magnitude, having a skilled, trained, knowledgeable workforce, especially from the community that's in that area, I think would be very important. And um, with apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, it would be a very good resource and way that folks in that own community could um, be able to obtain some good living wage careers in the construction industry while this project is going on. Um, schools in the area, if, if it was started ahead of time, because it sounds like it's gonna be about two uh, years before it's in the making, that would give students who are getting ready to come out of high schools time to get um, this training in their, in their schools before they graduate and then they could graduate and literally go into a good living wage career in the construction industry. Um, there's also tribal programs, I know pre-apprenticeship programs in the area that um, would be helpful if uh, apprenticeship utilization is considered and used during the building of these, you know, projects. So this is just a, a point I wanted to put out there and um, I'm happy to be a resource and available if anybody had any questions on that and wanted to reach out. Um, you know, I've helped many programs across the state within the correctional facilities, schools, all over to um, help grow and build these pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. Thank you for your time. So Emily, I'll address that really quick. Um, so for SUMAS specifically, uh, the SUMAS Land Port of Entry Project has been designated by the administration uh, to participate in what the Department of Labor calls a mega project. So that is essentially an outreach program that the Department of Labor will run in coordination with GSA for the general contractor community to uh, tie into local resources for trades. And essentially it's, it's mimicking what you just described. So that's actually uh, something that's being uh, incorporated into the larger SUMAS project, so. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Paul, you are up next. And Megan, we will address your questions after Paul has finished speaking. Go ahead. Hello, good evening. Uh, Paul Gallivan. My, uh, uh, my family is uh, Native Alaskan, and a lot of them rooted in linen. Um, I'm also a carpenter, and uh, I'm a 20-year veteran with the Army. So when it comes to the project that's coming up in uh, Sumas, the, the things that would be most important as far as uh, economy in my mind. So one business owner already spoke to the idea of how Sumas is going to be affected by a possible closure. Um, some of the mitigating efforts 
could be a local hire, uh, preferred entry process. Um, I realize that you're working with LNI, uh, but to expand the LNI is not necessarily going to uh, reflect the local hire process. And that is something that could come out of this process as a priority. Also, um, creating a, an environment where um, minorities or underprivileged could uh, find resources to be working on this project that would come in the source of transportation from uh, designated areas to increase their ability to work on this project. Um, these types of efforts are going to go a long way to um, speaking loudly on uh, this panel's effort to seeing SUMAS as a partner in the construction of this project. I don't know if you're trying to speak, Pat, but I did want to thank you, Paul, for your comments, but. Uh, go ahead, Emily. No, that's that's all. I didn't, I don't want to interrupt. I, didn't, I can't see if your mouth is moving or not. Sorry yeah, about sorry that. about that. So um, just like I spoke to the previous question, I think from Lisa. Um, so part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, there are, five, I want to say, uh, projects that the administration designated to uh, receive the Department of Labor. So this is U.S. Department of Labor. It's not Washington, Illinois, right? It's the United States Department of Labor mega project designation. Um, I recommend everybody just go to the Department of Labor website and look up mega project or just Google mega project. It explains exactly what it is. But it's an intensive outreach for uh, the Department of Labor during the solicitation phase when we go into the design build acquisition. So this would be the actual general contractor who's going to go out and hire all the sub trades, right? It's an outreach program for them so that they can go out and hire small disadvantaged businesses, minority businesses, underserved utilization, uh, HUD zones, right? So it's an outreach program to help the general contractors make it easier for them to loop in all the pools of tradespeople that you and Lisa both spoke about. So this project specifically, SUMAS, not Linden, but SUMAS has that special emphasis that the administration is focusing on. So it's getting a lot of attention from the Department of Labor. Um, that's a good thing. Um, but it's, it's, like I said, an outreach program. Um, the other thing is we are looking at this point for, well, let me start this one. So we're looking first uh, to hire one general contractor um, to do both projects, to, to expand both ports. And for GSA, me selfishly, it just makes my job easier. Okay. Um, but we're not set it yet. We're still evaluating our acquisition strategy. That's one of the things that will actually flush out during the project development study. But if everything goes as it's planned now, and it's still to be determined, it's not set in stone, um, we would hire one general contractor. So the thinking would be, if that general contractor is going out and using all these trades for SUMAS, because that's what Department of Labor is trying to market to them, and they're trying to reach out to the community and support all that, that same pool of contractors or subcontractors would be working on Linden. So Linden would technically get the benefit of the mega project status that's being applied to SUMAS. And if we kept them together, you would presume if it's one contractor and they're plugged into the mega project program that the Department of Labor is running, that it would be beneficial to both SUMAS and Linden. I also want to just briefly touch on um, closing SUMAS. So by no means is closing SUMAS and or Linden a done deal. We are open to all your comments. And the comments about the closing at night maybe is a possibility. That's actually something we could look at and we will look at. Um, things like the impact to the grocery store, something we're going to take into consideration. And I appreciate the comment. 
Um, these are the comments that we want to hear because the people that live on the ground know the town better than we do. And that's why we're asking you for those comments, right? In no way, shape, or form is closing SUMAS a done deal. I just want to put that out there. Second, even if we were to close it, and I'm not saying we are, we don't know right now how long the closure would actually be, right? So that's part of the NEPA process, and that's part of the project development study process where we dial into, one, we have a fixed amount of money that we've been given. So everybody goes out and buys things on the local economy. Inflation has been going crazy, right? Everything costs more. Well, our money was provided two years ago, and we're going to spend it starting in 26. That's five years from the time we received the money. Think about how much money that's actually going to be worth and how much that dollar is going to buy five years from when we originally got it. We're fixed with the amount of money. We're not going to get any more money. So we have to figure out how to solve this problem for CBP with our available budget. We're open to all different ideas at this point, right? So not saying the port's going to close, not saying it's not going to close. It may close for a month. It may close for two weeks. It may close for the duration. It may never close, right? We are trying to figure out what is the best way to make this happen to minimize the impact. The alternative it is crossing the border, if we keep it open, is going to be a nightmare for two years. That's the alternative, right? Because we will be closing lanes. We'll be moving traffic from one place to another. We may be closing personal vehicle lanes for a period of time and then reopening them, shifting traffic from one port to the other. So these are all things that we have to evaluate, taking into account your great comments when we go through the project development study and this NEPA process. So I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. So the next question is from Megan. And her first question is, are there plans for the Sumas crossing to include a walking slash biking plan that goes directly into Canada for pedestrians? Her second question is, during which phase will buildings in Sumas actually be acquired? I'm asking as someone who works and lives in the areas that are marked for expansion. Okay. Uh, Robbie, I don't know if it would make sense just to go back to that one slide that showed the area around Sumas, so I can kind of speak to it a little bit. But uh, so the first question about the biking, walking and biking, um, that is one of the things we're considering. What we can't do, unfortunately, because people have to get processed by both CBP on the American side. And if you're going to Canada, their uh, analogous agency is CBSA, Canadian Border Security Agency. Um, so Pedestrians and bikers have to go through a vetting process, just like people coming across in a car, right? So they have to go through a main inspection, uh, just like they do now. They walk down from Canada, they go into the primary building, you go through a little inspection process, you get your paperwork cleared, and you continue on through SUMAS, and you go presumably to the downtown area, right? Go back and reverse, you're going to go through that same thing when you go up into Canada, through the CBSA port uh, on the other side of the border. What we're looking to do with this project is given the amount of uh, pedestrian bike traffic that comes across, we're looking to create uh, essentially two sterile corridors. One, as the public transits north and south across the border, um, outside of that building, at least on the American side, we can't really touch the Canadian side, right? But on the American side, how the people come across the border cross the traffic, go into the building, then come out of our building, and then go back into the city of Sumas, right? So that exterior part, we're looking to build a sterile corridor. We're also looking to build somewhat of a sterile corridor inside the building to keep different groups of people separate, right? So it's, yes, we're going to uh, address the um, bike and pedestrians, but how we do that one is still up in the air, um, but it's not as simple as, you know, let's just build a bridge over the border, have the bus people or the bike people and the pedestrian just walk across kind of thing. They'd still have to go in and out of the building, 
both on the American side and then heading back into Canada on the CBSA side. What was the second question, Robbie? Sorry. No problem. The second question is during which phase will buildings oh, and CBS yep. actually be acquired? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to show that one slide with the, the area or not, but um, right now we're in the NEPA process, right? So thanks. So um, everybody, hopefully we can see the little red outline on the, the map. Um, small note at the bottom of the slide says uh, it's a draft pre-decisional, a potential area of impact. And I want to repeat that. It's draft and it's pre-decisional. We have not made up our mind exactly what the port's going to look like. As I spoke to before, we have a limited amount of money and we are not going to get more. And we need to figure out how best to utilize that money to satisfy CBPs and all the other government agencies who operate at SUMAS or Linden. Right now we're looking at SUMAS because that was the question. Um, so the red area, uh, what I can say is the absolute maximum area that we might impact. I don't even think, well, it, it's, it will not get any larger than that because we just don't have the funding for it. I can't say if you own a business or you're a resident inside that area, whether or not we're actually going to acquire your property. That's what's being determined as part of both the NEPA process and our project development study, where we weigh that how much money we have against how we're going to solve CBP's problems and make the traffic flow uh, across both sides of the border more efficient and safe and how we're going to minimize the impact to the local community, right? That all goes into the sausage making of this whole project. Um, so those areas would be further delineated as part of both the NEPA process that we're going through now, as well as the project development study. At the end of that, we'll have a better idea of which properties we may need to acquire. And then that starts a whole separate process for GSA where a separate group that works with us, uh, our real estate group, um, has to follow what's called the Uniform Act. So the Uniform Act is a federal government law that basically dictates how the federal government purchases property from private citizens or private parties. It could be a business, it could be a private citizen as a residence. They'll follow that entire process through. That probably won't happen. We won't be ready to even start that process for probably a better part of a year. All righty. Um, thanks, Pat. Next question is from Melissa. Um, is the option of keeping the port open partial, keeping the ports partially open during construction being considered? Yes. All right. Um, next question is from Meg. Inbound commercial vehicles waiting for clearance to cross currently need to park along Railroad Avenue, causing traffic and security concerns. Is this Railroad Avenue on the Canadian side? As a resident of Sumas, I can emphatically say I have never seen commercial vehicles waiting on this avenue. Indeed, in my 14 years here, I have rarely seen trucks waiting to go north across the border. So the trucks going, well, two questions, right? So unfortunately you probably can't zoom in, but uh, Railroad Avenue is the road that goes, if I'm not mistaken, right along the railroad north to south as it comes out of the port. So vehicles that are parked southbound that have come through our port are actually parked along Railroad Avenue and that's one of the problems that CBP has that they need to solve. It creates a safety issue, right? There are vehicles that have been semi-inspected um, that need to be cleared before they're allowed to depart the port, even though technically, I believe they've actually left the port property. So you'll see a CBP officer out there while that vehicle is parked outside the quote unquote port property on Railroad Avenue. And they're making sure that that commercial traffic doesn't leave without being fully clear. Part of the reason 
were expanding to the south, at least looking to expand to the south, specifically directly below the port, is to prevent or eliminate that possibility. So that queuing traffic before it left the port would remain on port property fully under control of the port. Because once they go through that existing fence that's there now, it, I believe it's Harrison Avenue, once they go through that fence, they technically left the port while they're still under control of the CBP officers. So it creates a little bit of a control safety issue. And that's one of the reasons why CBP is actually looking to expand southward specifically to address that issue. And there is no place on the port, unfortunately, to queue that traffic up and still maintain full operational control on federal property without completely backing up the, the traffic southbound into the country from the Canadian side. And if we were to do that, then it becomes an international thing where CBSA and the Canadian Foreign Secretary, whatever they call it, that's really the GB, but the foreign government relation would come to the United States and ask us to speed up our process because we're essentially blocking their roads, right? With respect to the outbound traffic, so the outbound traffic going into Canada actually goes across uh, Sumas Avenue. So that's the far, if you're looking at the picture, that's the uh, red line that's going north to south, up and down vertically on the page at the far right-hand side. That's Sumas Avenue. That's the outbound area right where Robbie just circled. That's the outbound path of travel for commercial traffic. CBP's, uh, one of CBP's requirements is to not only inspect the traffic that comes into the United States and goods and people, but they're also responsible for inspecting both goods and personnel and vehicles that are leaving the country to make sure that if somebody's not supposed to be leaving the country, like they're wanted for a crime or they're taking contraband to Canada and it shouldn't be leaving the country, CBP has a mission to also inspect those vehicles northbound before they get into Canada. So where Robbie circled, the plan for CBP in that area is to actually construct an outbound inspection area where they would pull across uh, commercial vehicles, and inspect them before they leave the United States and go into Canada. And if they have a need to further inspect the vehicle, there would be a loading dock and warehouse type area building in that general area where they could offload material from, say, a tractor trailer and do a more in-depth investigation or inspection before that truck and the goods were cleared to go into Canada. So that's actually what's planned over in the area where Robbie circled in blue. It's not really to queue up the traffic before it goes into Canada. It's actually for CBP to fully uh, satisfy one of their mission requirements that they have now. Hopefully that answered the question. All right. The next question is from Melissa. Uh, are the tw summer 2026 FIFA games schedule being considered in determining the construction start dates? Yes. So if you remember, and I don't know if Robbie can go, I think it might be the next slide after this, uh, the milestones. So uh, FIFA, uh, both Vancouver and, uh, great, thanks. So both Vancouver and Seattle are uh, group stage hosts. I don't think they're hosting any of the knockout round stages, but they are group stages. So that's where four countries play in one location. Round Robin, the two top teams go on, right? Um, so uh, the World Cup is going to run from June to mid-July. If you look at our schedule, it just so happens that it lines up like that. It was totally a fluke, but it works. We're not going to award... Uh, the construction contract until September of 2025, so two years from now, and they will be going through design through February and March, and the construction periods for both Linden and Sumas, while we show July and August, will take into account that World Cup will be done before impact to either one of those ports. So yes, it is on our radar, and thank you for the question. And then, Randy, you've been waiting patiently with your hand up. You are on the clock when you begin speaking. 
Thank you. So if we could go back to the slide that Robbie had up with the circle on it, um, our house lands within that circle. We are actually the closest house to the red line. Um, my question is, what type of safeguards are they going to be putting on our yard or just outside of our yard to protect us from the fumes from the big trucks, um, potential safety um, hazards, the sound, if that's going to be an inspection area, is there going to be any kind of safeguards put in place for us? Good question. We haven't fully worked through that yet, and we will look into it. Um, CBP, for full disclosure, they already do inspections in that area now. So you're talking about one of the residences to the immediate east of Sumas Avenue, right? In that general area? That's correct. Okay. So you aren't actually in our area of impact, if you will. We wouldn't be acquiring your property. Um, but your point about you know traffic coming along, whether that's construction traffic during the modernization or once the port is operational, the construction traffic that's still going through that area, how would that impact you, right? So great question. We'll look into it. Um, as far as the construction, I can tell you for sure, um, they'll be putting up different things to minimize the sound. Um, they won't be going onto your property, I don't believe, to do any work. All the work would be done on Sumas Avenue and to the west, right? So we would be cognizant of all the properties outside that area. Um, but that's also something that NEPA and our project development study would further flush out. Because right now we do have a bit of truck um, traffic. It's it's nothing that we can't handle, but enlarging the truck border going north i have heard that they're going to be routing a majority of the trucks going east within bc through the sumas border once it has been constructed to hold more traffic is that something you can confirm no so um there have been other comments that have been issued or sent in through our public websites asking about kind of the same question. So um, I can't say for sure exactly how the traffic's gonna shake out between Pacific Highway, which is 10 miles to the west of Linden, right? That right. port's being expanded. At the same time that Linden is being expanded as the same time as Sumas is being expanded. So if CBP and GSA were only looking to expand SUMAS, I would be concerned, just as a person, that traffic's going to come through my port, right? Because it's the newest, brightest, shiniest thing, and it's got the biggest, you know, ability to absorb, you know, new traffic, if you will, right? We're actually expanding all three ports together. And one of the thinking, at least from the American side coming into the United States is a lot of the commercial traffic that's queued up now at Pack Highway and at Sumas, if lending goes the way CBP wants and it becomes a 24 seven fully commercial port, a lot of the traffic's gonna go from Sumas and Pack Highway and start going through Linden. So I would expect actually less traffic, at least inbound into the United States, outbound into Canada, we have less control. And I know that's maybe not the best answer, but we can't control how traffic leaves our country and gets into Canada. That's really for the Canadians. And I'm not really trying to punt, but that's, you know, that's the best I can say. I can say coming into the country, I would expect commercial traffic, just me, just looking kind of at these projects together, I would expect some of the commercial traffic and some of the POV traffic, the personal vehicle traffic, to go away from SUMAS. And th over time, they would even out. But I would expect a net negative slightly from SUMAS at best. And really what we're talking about 
is more efficient processing of the vehicles coming into the country and then performing these additional inspections of vehicles leaving the country, right? So the other way I look at this is this isn't like a field of dream situation where if you build it, they will come, right? If we expand SUMAS, they will come. Or if we only expand Linden, they'll all go to Linden and not come through SUMAS or PAC Highway. The problem for all three of these ports is they're already here. The ports are already past their capacity to safely handle the traffic. That's why you see cars queuing up on Sumas or Cherry Street and why you see cars queuing up on the Canadian side waiting to come into the United States. Neither port has the ability at this point to process the traffic. So adding the lanes and the processing capabilities and the additional officers that CBP would look to hire to staff these lanes would simply allow the traffic that's already there and is forecast for the next 20 to 50 years to process through more quickly so that it doesn't back up on Cherry Street and clog the downtown business area, right? So that it doesn't queue up right in your backyard for you specifically along Sumas Avenue, right? Thank you. Yep. Does that answer your question? At least a little? Uh, pretty much. You know, I'm just, okay. right now we don't even have signs out there that say no to, no idling. So we have trucks that sit outside of our yard and just idle for hours while they have a nap waiting to get their paperwork cleared through to Canadian. And they're on right. the American side. They haven't crossed over Harrison Avenue. So they're just sitting there idling for hours. Right. And my concern is one or two trucks, you know, it, it sucks, but if we have 12 trucks out there doing the same thing, what does that do for our health? Totally valid point, but to me, that traffic's already here, right? And it's already coming. The outbound inspections that CBP is looking to do, the vehicles would be stopped at that point. So they would bring the vehicle into a sterile area. They would offload or inspect the truck in a more detailed fashion. Sure. While that's happening, the, the operator's out of the vehicle, standing away in a secured little area. And just the CBP officer is going through the, the vehicle at that point. So okay. those vehicles would be shut off. The so other traffic that's still going moment. northbound, that's going to stay the way it is until Canada expands their port. And again, unfortunately, we don't have control over that. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I have not seen any other questions in the chat and Wait. I don't see anyone else's hand raised as of now. Robbie, we, we do have one other question I see from Sig. He's the owner of Package Express. Is it in the chat? I might not. I don't know if I've seen that. Oh, let's see. He um, direct messaged me. Sig, if you don't mind, if you're on here, do you mind raising your hand and speaking out? If not, just chat me and I can read your comment off. If you're still on. Okay, there he is. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, well, I'm the owner of Package Express. It's uh, uh, I've been notified that the building might be needed, but I see on the area of impact that it's just outside. Um, it's on Garfield Street on the south side, on southeast side. And am I correct to assume that I can breathe easy and, and not worry about um, the building being taken away? That's my question. Fully aware of who you are, right? You're famous. Um, you're honestly one of the reasons why there's such a big pedestrian crossing. I'm thinking at SUMAS, mm. um, your business. Um, so again, if you're in that red box, don't get too upset. Still not a done deal. If you're outside the red box, I breathe a little bit easier, but um, so specifically with your property. So yes, you are outside the property. Um, Anything south of, well, anything north of Garfield is potentially where we're looking to modernize the port. 
the area that's shown south of Garfield, which is just to the west of your property, the the next door in the in the parking lot next to that, and Cherry Street, would be essentially where we would have to reconnect Cherry Street coming out of the port. It's going to be shifted to the east a little bit. So we would have to bring Cherry Street back in at some point and marry up with Cherry Street as it continues south through the downtown area. So the area that we're showing right now, uh, just to the west of you, south of Garfield, and that little kind of leg that's sticking down there, that's essentially a potential area. If the port went all the way down as far south as we think it might, Worst case, it might. Um, that would be where we would somehow realign Cherry Street coming through the port with the existing Cherry Street as it mates up with the downtown area considering south. So I do not believe your building is going to be impacted. And I believe, don't hold me to this, we're still working through it. I believe we could probably make that transition to Cherry Street existing ahead of or just north of the Garfield intersection. But that's also something we have to work through with uh, both the state, because it's a state highway, Whatcom County, and the city of Sumas, right? But that's what's planned for that little area just to the south of Garfield. The only is just how do we reconnect the shifted over to the east Cherry Street to the existing Cherry Street as it continues south? Does that make sense? Yeah, so reasonably sure that you won't. I can stay there. We can stay there, but uh, but no guarantees, I guess. Um, I don't want to say yes or no, but if you were just asking me off the record, I would probably say yes, you could stay. But okay. don't hold me to that because we're still working through all this, right? I don't. I really am trying to be as honest as I can. We do okay. not know exactly what this is going to look like. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Going. We yep. need to plan for the future and know what's going on. So um, the best idea is possible. So, yes, thank you. Yep. But as of now, Yulia, like I said, your area is not being impacted. Um, it's it's just the, the very southern part of how we realign Cherry Street. Yeah. And it may just be we skirt around the corner somehow, but that's that's also part of the city of Sumas's call, right? Oh, Where yeah. would they like to see that intersection occur yeah well we actually do have a bathroom on the uh inside of that red line but um yeah. discuss that another day <laughs> yep know what you're talking about okay thank okay. you thank you um again i'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or any other hands raised? Thank you, Robbie. I don't have any direct messages um, from me either. That's what kind of threw me off and hopefully no one else sent a direct message, but if you did, um, GSA, we, we have this meeting, we're holding it until 7 p.m. So we will, um, all the presenters, GSA and Saul will stay on just in case if anyone has any additional questions or if you, you know, come up with something before 7 p.m., please do ask that. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're available up until the time. And just again, thank you um, for everybody for staying on, taking the time and all the comments. It just helps, you know, helps us during this environmental process and obviously um, during Pat's process as well with design and construction and planning. And again, how much we stress that everything right now is just in the preliminary stages. Nothing has been set in stone. We're still planning, but having these greatly helps us and even maybe to consider things we didn't fully think of and which will also be shared with CBP for any possible future operations that may impact SUMAS and um, its residents. Emily, one more question. Just oh, in. okay. Helen asks, how much yeah. say so do you have over the rest of Cherry Street in town? As a live on the ground resident, there's already not enough crosswalks over Cherry Street. It's dangerous now because many people jaywalk from one side of the street to the other. Can you authorize crosswalks? So from a federal government perspective, we are only allowed to touch property that we're actually going to touch, if that makes sense, right? So 
we can't work on uh, Cherry Street south of however far south that we're actually going to work. So if you're talking, say, two blocks south of Garfield, where Patrick's Package Express is, two blocks out of that where we're not going to be doing work, we can't direct anybody, the city of Sumas or anybody else, we can't direct our contractors to, to do the crosswalks. Within our boundary where we're actually working on the port expansion itself, yes, we can take care of crosswalks. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to solve the pedestrian corridor. One of the questions about the bike and pedestrian as they traverse through the port. So on the port itself, we can fix those crosswalks, but in the city outside of that area, no, we can't. With that said, part of the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed, um, there's also a program called Thriving Communities. So that's a separate pot of money that the federal government has that is available to local communities that are impacted by this project and other projects. It also provides funding for high-speed internet to low-served areas, right? So Thriving Communities is essentially a federal grant program where local communities that are impacted by this project or other bill project projects um, can apply for that funding so that they can upgrade uh, their infrastructure outside of our, you know, particular project footprint. So we've already uh, discussed that with both the city of Sumas and Linden. They're fully aware. Um, I know the city of Sumas, there was a question about flooding and, and natural disasters. Uh, the city of Sumas is also working with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers to address the flooding in the, the local immediate area. Um, I don't know if they'll be able to get thriving community funding to address whatever may come out of that initiative, um, but that's also another avenue that the city of Sumas might have uh, somewhere down the road. Hopefully that answered the question. All right, uh, Stephen Jordan, you have the floor. Apologies for the delay. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm the adjunct of the CMS American Legion, which is that area at the very northeast corner in that red area. Takes up that whole area there. There's three areas that I'd like to address. Uh, first off, the major differences between Linden Crossing and Sumas Crossing. If you look at the anatomy of the area, uh, the uh, Linden Crossing Guide Meridian is all out by itself, has nothing else around it. It doesn't support any other businesses but itself. Closing it means nothing to anybody. Uh, this crossing is directly going through residential business area, uh, there are only three er three ways to get through town. You can have what was supposed to be the truck route that goes through the industrial area, the industrial side of town, Main Street, and Sumas Avenue. Sumas, I, I used to live on the south end of town, and people would call me all the time. Uh, can you tell me if this, the border's backed up? I'd walk out my front door and look down the street and go, yeah, there's cars down there, they're not moving. And, uh, or it's clear. So somebody would say, okay, well, I'm going to go to town. You go to town when it's backed up like that, you can't move, you can't go to the post office, you can't go nowhere. Uh, it's all they can do to keep Canadian cars off of Sumas Avenue, just so residents of town can travel north and south. Uh, we at the American Legion, if you, we, we border Sumas Avenue where the trucks go into Canada and they stage for Canada. Uh, our parking lot enters behind our building. Well, that's also where CVP does their inspections of trucks. And that is two lanes north, one lane south. That one lane south 
comes out of our parking lot and nobody's moving anywhere when they have all three lanes with trucks going north at a standstill. When the trucks are also supposed to come into town through the truck route, which turns off of Front Street, leaving Cherry Street just for POVs, privately owned vehicles. Uh, and then the southbound is supposed to turn west and go over the railroad tracks, coming out, coming southbound out of the, uh, the port where they turn and they, they turn down Cherry Street. So you have all this truck traffic going both directions and it just, and it clogs up everything even that much more. This intersection right here is a four-way stop. We have no stoplights in town. Uh, we don't need any stoplights in town, but what we do need is direction of traffic rather than a free-for-all, which is basically what it is now. When you say truck traffic is not going to be impacted, we are the gateway to the Alcan Highway. Trucks choose to go through our port rather than going through uh, the Guide Meridian port or Blaine. Uh, I've been in trucking industry for 23 years. I'm now retired. During that time, I've been through the ports many times. Majority of the time, you go through Blaine because you're going into the metropolitan area of Vancouver, Richmond, Surrey. Trucks don't go through the guide going north unless they're empty, primarily because they don't have uh, bonding there. They choose to go through, and they're, they, they're told to go through where they have their customs paperwork going through, which is Sumas, because they're, they're trying to skirt around the traffic. I don't know if you've ever been on the other side of the border there, but it's like dropping into downtown LA within a mile. Trucks are a mile away from Highway 1 going east where they can skirt around all that if they go through Sumas. If they go through the other two ports, they drop right into that miserable amount of traffic. Um, if there are closures here, it impacts everybody that lives here. If you close the guide, it only impacts the people that work at the port. Uh, there really should be uh, a great deal of thought about, especially north and southbound traffic to where it lessens the impact upon the, the, the residents that live all up and down here. I don't know if, you're, if I'm controlling the cursor or not, but this area here on the east side of Sumas is almost impossible to get to when the traffic, if the traffic is backed up and every month there is a holiday in Canada, and that whole weekend you can't get from the south end of town to the north end or to Garfield. Stephen, I'm sorry, it, it's been over two minutes. So that's fine. I was just trying to give as much information as I could in a short amount of time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And then, so I see we did have Jason, who I didn't miss over anyone, but Stephen, just so you know, I know we have short amount of time, but please do put your comments in. You know, we shared all the options that you have, but then also um, you have multiple ways to, to share those comments. And I do highly encourage you to, to write those down and email us or mail them um, or 
just fill out that comment form. And then I see we have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Robbie, if you can read Jason's. I tried responding, but we can go over it. Uh, actually, Meg's is the next. Comment. Oh, sorry, Meg. No problem. Um, Meg says, it seems that a factor in idling cars on Cherry Street is due to the fact that the CBP is not staffing every POV lane of entry. I have waited at the border many times because a majority of the lanes are closed, even though the cars were backed up a few blocks. If we expand the port, how can we be sure the CBP will open up all the new lanes? It seems the idling issue for POV traffic is a staffing issue and could be solved by putting more agents on the border and using the lanes that we have now. So Meg, are you asking about the southbound traffic coming from Canada into the United States on Sumas Way? That's the Canadian equivalent. It's Canada 11. Um, coming southbound, are you talking about vehicles in like downtown Sumas proper who are sitting on Cherry Street waiting to go northbound into Canada? Because if it's the second one, that's actually a CBSA, Canadian Border Service Agency issue um kind of dovetailing into a lot of what steve was saying vehicles going out of the country into canada are clogging up the streets in sumas vehicles coming southbound into the country are clogging up the streets on uh the abbotsford side at least for sumas or the abbotsford side in canada right so all right jason asks Will the environmental impact statement include impacts to the floodplain and displacement of flood water? Yes and no. Um, so uh, GSA has what is called the public building service. That's where all of the GSA people who are on this call work for. Um, so the public building service is the arm of GSA that owns and operates all the real property for the federal government. That's the easiest way to think of this, right? We're the landlord for most of the federal government agencies. So PBS has a standard called the P100, uh, PAPA 100. And that's essentially our Bible for uh, everything that we do for facilities, how we build them, what they look like, how they're sustained, how they operate. So all of those things get taken into account. So uh, the PBS 100, uh, P100 has a requirement that we don't build within a floodplain. Um, so obviously we're not going to build within a floodplain. Technically speaking, this may sound crazy to some of the people that live in Sumas. So the area that we're actually looking at in that red box is not part of a floodplain. It's not one of the 100-year floodplains. With that said, we know that the area floods, right? That's not really from the port. That's from other issues that have happened. And the last one in November was like a perfect storm of three or four things happening and make it so bad. Um, so long story short for the flooding, uh, yes, we do take it into account. Our mantra, if you will, is do no harm. So we coordinate with both the city um, and now they're coordinating with FEMA and the Corps of Engineers to look at a bigger, broader uh, SUMAS wide issue of flooding and how they can address it. Um, whatever they do and whatever comes out of that initiative in partnership with those other federal agencies will take into account and obviously work with them so that whatever we do on the port isn't basically, you know, kicking them in the foot when they're trying to solve a problem. We don't want to make their problem worse and whatever they're incorporating on the outside of the fence line of the port, we want to make sure we take into account so that that doesn't impact the port. So uh, long story short, yes, we're taking into account the floodplain. Um, we're responsible to make sure that the floodwaters, if they came from the port, don't go outside the port. Um, but outside of the federal boundary, uh, we're actually not permitted. We don't have the funding or authorization, um, but obviously we're going to take into account what the city is doing and we don't want to do anything to hurt what the city is doing. So um, hopefully that answers your question. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to add um, to that for Jason's question, pretty much what, what Pat said, but we do have to be careful and we will consider we can't negatively impact the floodplains. That's one of the things and that's going to be worked out through design, you know, how it, when it comes to elevation, all of that takes into account. There's no floodways in that area, but there are floodplains. We understand that we have a 500 year floodplain and then we have the actual 100 year floodplain which greatly impacts that area. We consider all routes of egress and ingress as well. So that's all being considered when looking at this area. The the port itself know how it, it's it's situated. It isn't within the LPOE, but we understand we do have other areas in that in other properties and areas that are impacted by those whether it be 500 or 100 year floodplains. But again, what Pat said we don't want to negatively impact that or add to it. It's, you know, whenever would they design it or how they construct it, it's to help um, alleviate and not add to it. What Emily said, yes. And then the last uh, remaining point in the chat is, He's correct. I believe this is referring to uh, Stephen's comments from before. He's correct. Trucks will not opt to use the Linden port. The distance is longer. And have you seen Meridian Street going south? It's very narrow, ditches and trees on either side, dangerous for large trucks. So, uh, Washdot, um, who also controls uh, Guide Meridian, uh, going up to the port in Linden. They have a project separate from the port expansion to actually expand Guide Meridian from the port all the way down to, uh, what's the crossroad? Um, it's Highway 9. I don't know what you really call it. Badger Road, Badger. Um, so Washdot already has a project. Uh, I don't know if it's funded yet, but their project is, as far as I know, it's been designed, they're waiting for funding. So they already have a plan outside of the expansion, whether or not the port expands or not, um, to actually widen Guide Meridian Road. At least that was my understanding. But she is absolutely true. It's a it's a kind of narrow road. Thank you, Pat. And then Robbie, I don't I don't have any other comments at least showing for me or any more direct messages, but I know we have about 12 more minutes. So I don't know if we if anybody else has any questions. We'll be on here until seven. Um, if anybody wanted to elaborate further on their comments, um, they can do so. And again, one more reminder, I will be sending out the informational handouts to the distribution list after this email. Um, I have all of your emails from your registration emails. Thank you for providing those and you will receive those handout information. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Meg has one more question. Will I see be, that. Uh, Go ahead. She says, will there be an in-person meeting which may prove to be more accessible to residents of SUMAS? So at the time what for NEPA, because that's what we're doing right now, we do not have any plans to have an in-person meeting. Um, like this one and the next one, we're planning for the draft EIS when that's ready. That would be virtual as well. Now, unless, you know, GSA determines that an in-person meeting is needed um, based off of comments and feedback, then that may change. But at the moment, we're only planning for virtual.
I don't know if Robbie, you have any, or you see any other comments come through. That looks like no. I have not seen any other comments come through. Got it. And again, folks, I dropped the link that's been put in the chat several times, but there is an online comment form for you to submit written comments in addition to the other mechanisms that I will put up again on the screen. Okay, and I, I do see one comment from Helen regarding the virtual meeting and inaccessibility. So that's something if, again, if you, um, since it sounds like maybe there are some folks that might have been interested and didn't have the opportunity to attend today, um, if you can share this information with them, especially when it comes to comments, because if there is like a great need for an in-person meeting based off the comments, you know, we, we go off of those as well, then that's kind of where GSA may consider um, having an actual in-person meeting, but your comments are needed. So please do share with your friends, especially if you know that they don't have, whether it be access to internet or time or anything like that, please share and encourage them to make those comments. And then Brandy, I see yours. Um, her question is, is there a link to rewatch this meeting? There will be. That, that's one of the biggest things why this was recorded. All um, the chat box will also be available. Um, and the presentation will be uploaded to both the Linden and SUMAS web pages that were mentioned earlier. Um, so the, it will be available, not the, the link per se, but the actual meeting and recording itself in the presentation. And just to add to what Robin was saying about the posters, um, it sounds like, you know, he'll be emailing them, but those will also be available on the website. Those should be posted. Yes. And the posters um, include a lot of the, the same information that were that was included in this PowerPoint presentation that sort of consolidates it and it's a shorter version of it, just so um, you know it's coming. And for those, you know, someone may be thinking about additional comments to ask or questions, I consider those comments as well. Um, GSA will be on here for until 7 p.m. But in the meantime, I do just want to extend a very, really appreciative and thank you for, for everyone that attended and just taking interest in this project. It, it means a lot. And just to have that feedback is, is very helpful it, and it's crucial. Um, when working on any type of environmental review and even obviously for Pat when it comes down to his design. And I want to thank Pat and Kim as well for all the hard work that you guys have been doing um, and on these projects. I know you have your own as well for DNC and for Historic as well. And then another huge thank you to Solve, our environmental consultant, for helping us put this together and hosting it um, virtually um, today. So again, another huge thank you and taking the time. Um, before we conclude, Helen has one more question, or I shouldn't say one more, but she has another question. As long as you're buying property, why not buy property outside of the business or residential area? Uh, one, because we're not allowed, right? We're only allowed under the Uniform Act to uh, purchase property where we're actually going to impact them. So we can't buy a property outside that red line just because somebody wants to sell or it'd be a good idea. Um, if the question was getting more towards, hey, do we want to move the port so that we don't impact this? Um, that would essentially take like an act of God. It would, it would take an act of Congress, literally an act of Congress that all 50 states would have to approve. And on the Canadian side, it would take an act of parliament for them to do it. It is a nightmare to move a port. And that was one of the questions we actually thought about too. Why don't we combine Linden and Sumas, pick a place somewhere in the middle that's farmland and just buy the farmland and make a giant port that serves both volumes of traffic, but that would take forever to get done. I mean, there are projects on the Southern border 
that are essentially doing something like that where they're looking to expand to a new location. And that's like a 20 year process. So if you think the traffic in Sumas and Linden, not so much Linden, but Sumas is bad now and Pack Highway, it'll be another 20 years before any relief is given, right? So that's why we're essentially looking to do it at the existing locations because it's just too involved. There are too many people in the government would have their hand in the kitty on that one. And I work for the government, so. And Brandy also adds moving the Sumas port would kill our town. It, that's the other reason too, right? We don't want to, we understand that these border towns are extremely important, right? And for a long, uh, large part, they survive off the port traffic on both sides of the port, right? So that's something we don't want to do. And just going to Brandy's question or comment, I wasn't suggesting we move the port, right? So that was never on the drawing board. One, because it's absolutely impossible. It would take too long. And the other point being what we just spoke about where it's too important to these local communities, right? So. Oh, and I see Bruce um, from the city of Sumas. Thank you, um, Bruce, for that. And same, Brandy. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Well, again, we'll be wrapping up at 6.59. Maybe we have a minute or a little less than a minute and a, another huge thank you. Um, we, you will be um, receiving, like Robbie said, you'll be receiving those posters and please keep a lookout on each project webpage for all the uploads, um, the posters, the comment form, the presentation and the actual um, draft, the, the paper presentation or the downloadable presentation for you to look at the slides as well. Stephen Jordan has his hand up. Is that a new question? Uh, I believe it is a new question. I just had a comment about uh, if we did have a live, like town conference, that uh, the American Legion would be an uh, available venue for that, for the community. That's all I had.
Thank you, Stephen. Alrighty, folks, that concludes our meeting for tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah.